Hey Indie Filmmakers, I'm Nick Bodmer. I'm Griffin Hammond, and on this week's episode, we have answers to your burning questions about the new Panasonic GH5S. Plus, your questions about daylight balanced bulbs, how to transfer large video files online, and whether you should give your client the raw footage. Hello, Nick. GH5S? Don't don't say hi to me. we got to get to this. <laughs> I'm You're right. Excited. I think people are going to want to hear the 10 big differences over the, uh, the camera that came out with last year, the GH5, the one I have. You uh, have 10 big differences? You made a yeah. listicle? I did make a list, yeah. <laughs> In fact, if you're if you are already bored of hearing us talk, I suppose you could go straight to Hey Dot Film and just read the show notes. <laughs> you could yeah. already be ahead of me, and then you can just stop listening and be done. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, don't do that. We need you. But it's funny because Panasonic announced this new camera at CES last week uh, in your in your town, Las Vegas. Las Vegas, yeah, it was quite a CES. There was a flooding and power outages and all kinds of craziness. Well, yeah, they were joking, like, the power went out at CES, and it was like, it's a great chance to show off the new low-light camera from Panasonic. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, unlike last year, we were not at CES this time, but I did get a chance to take a look at this camera early. I was filming some behind-the-scenes for Panasonic with several filmmakers, uh, which we'll talk about but I suppose we should just get right to what the deal with this camera is. So, Griffin, could you tell me the 10 changes to the Panasonic (laughs) GH5S? Would you perhaps have a list of 10 things you could share with me? I do, but first I'm going to read this tweet from Carla Walton, who was wondering if we were going to talk about the GH5 on the next podcast. She would love to hear our thoughts on its new sensor, low light capabilities, and no stabilization. Did you know that well, this one go. does not have... There's a new sensor, it has low light capabilities, and it doesn't have stabilization. Right, and this was a question, actually, like the next tweet here is a question that I got from Scott Link, who was wondering if I could speculate why Panasonic removed the in-body image stabilization. It's a great feature in the GH5, so why would they not put it in the GH5S? And I think I suggested to him that it's probably because of the new sensor, and I didn't know all the details so i ran it past my friend matt who works at panasonic and he told me that they actually it's actually now a multi-aspect sensor i feel like i've heard that before though what the gh5 is not a multi-aspect right i think the last time panasonic had a multi-aspect sensor meaning that uh, like some some crop some crops are like uh, wider than others. I don't know why I'm like envisioning this better than I can explain it. Um, you know, with the GH5, when you pretty much every mode you shoot in, photo, video, 4K, or 1080, they all have the same width on the sensor. Uh, but with yep. this new sensor, it's multi aspect because, like, the C4K mode, the really widescreen mode, actually uses a wider portion of the sensor, uh, which actually changes okay. the crop factor. So if if you love getting wide angle shots, I suppose the GH5S would be great for you because your existing lenses that you're already using, they will look a little bit wider in the C4K mode. It'll actually be a 1.8 crop factor instead oh, of two. Oh, interesting. So on the Micro Four Thirds format, there's a little bit of wiggle room in the lenses that we're not necessarily taking advantage of right now. Yeah, so what I learned is that they built in some wiggle room from the beginning when they designed Micro Four Thirds to be a stabilized sensor to have some room for the sensor to stabilize. Aha, uh-huh. okay, yeah. But with the GH5S, they wanted to go in and make it like a low light beast. So one of the ways they did that is by making the sensor a little bit bigger. Just, you know, if it's a little bit bigger, it can capture more light. Yep. So, but the problem is if they had added in body image stabilization, one, I don't know if it would even fit with the sensor that they were making, but it definitely would have caused vignetting. Yeah, you would see as the sensor moved, you'd lose edges. Right. (laughs) So uh, probably a good idea that they didn't include it, yeah. So just thinking through that, that means, if I'm understanding this correctly, though, that lens stabilization should still work just fine if your lens is stabilized. It's just the sensor stabilization that it doesn't have. Yeah, so if you're mad that IBIS, in-body image stabilization, is gone, you still have it in all your native Panasonic lenses. Well, many of them And you know... 
I also think, don't you think um, handheld stabilizers, like electronic stabilizers, are way more common than they were even just a year or two ago? And maybe having it built into the body is a little less important for the types of pros who are going to put this on a big rig that's already stabilized? Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I think Panasonic said, we're trying to make this for... I mean, it's clearly a more filmmaker-centric camera than the GH5. I love the GH5, and it's a really great filmmaking tool and photography tool. Uh, we'll talk about some one photography feature they added to the GH5S, but generally it's a camera that's focused on filmmakers, and they figure a lot of filmmakers, especially, you know, I filmed with, with uh, Jacob Schwartz in Pleasant Grove, Utah, and if you watch the behind-the-scenes I shot... He's never using it handheld. He's always using it on a dolly or a gimbal or a crane or something. So, yeah, you can do stabilization outside the camera. So does this make it a camera maybe less suited for the type of work you do since you are such a run-and-gun handheld type shooter? Arguably, yeah. I mean, I think when they added in-body image stabilization with the GH5, I kind of thought, do I re even really need this? Because I was fine with GH4 and my lenses have, you know, I was buying lenses that have stabilization built in. But now that I compare the difference between my footage, I do like that I have it. So I'm not eager to jump onto the GH5S and lose, uh, lose stabilization. But I do have a gimbal. It might so be I, nice I, to have one body in your bag, though, for those times when you are locked down and you find yourself working with limited light. Yeah. Well, and I think the way you said it is 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 right. These cameras are complementary to each other. So you could imagine someone having both. I saw some anger on the like GH5 user forum on Facebook. Mm -hmm. It seemed like people were either mad. I mean, I think people are always mad when like a new camera comes out because they feel like it makes their old camera less good which <laughs> we all need to like stop feeling that way like we have amazing cameras let's not have too much gear lust but i was uh, using the gh2 until very recently <laughs> yeah but two i think people need to understand that this is not this is not the gh6 it's not the upgrade of the gh5 it does lose some features it's a different camera it's an alternative it's a variant model. yeah exactly yep so, so there will be reasons to, to shoot with this. And actually, we haven't even gotten to the primary reasons you would use this camera yet, um, which is the, the low-light capability. I guess uh, next on the list, real quick, just because I mentioned photography, is that they this new sensor actually is only a 10-megapixel sensor, unlike the 20-megapixel. Oh, okay. So you do lose a significant amount of size for your photos. But they did add 14-bit color for RAW. So they've increased the dynamic range of RAW files. Oh, okay. Yeah. And this really is like a dynamic range camera. That's the reason to have this thing. So they added two more stops at dynamic range. The GH5 is about 12 stops, and the new camera is 14 stops. And I'm looking now at a tweet we got from Jane Rollins, who... Uh, is saying that in-body image stabilization is not a deal breaker for her. Yeah, I think it just depends on the type of shooting you're doing and, you know, what your rig looks like. I, I just know there's so many people out there who are always on some sort of stabilizer. They have to turn off in-body image stabilization anyway because don't they kind of fight each other? Do you have, like, a gimbal and in-body image stabilization? Can't they kind of mess each other up? They can, although I've been impressed that it doesn't... It doesn't screw up as much as I would expect it to. So I actually usually have my stabilization on when I'm on a gimbal. Oh, okay. I think for me, the more likely thing is when I'm doing like a really slow pan on a tripod. You get to the end of the pan and the camera's like, oh, and you get what am I supposed wobble. to do now? Yeah. So that's a little rubber banding. Off. We got a tweet from James Tedrow. Could you explain what dual native ISO means? So that is the real big thing about this camera and i thought it was so it funny sounds that... very fancy maybe we yeah. should leave it more of a mystery <laughs> let's not even we don't want to ruin the is. excitement by telling people what it is i well, mean of course I... I know but why don't you pretend like i don't know because it <laughs> sounds confusing <laughs> well i thought it was funny that like the i knew about this camera before it came out uh but i, I was seeing all the rumors about it 
uh, and I thought it was funny that people knew it was going to be a low light camera, but no, luckily, I guess for Panasonic, no one leaked the fact that it was dual native ISO, which I was kind of excited. Like, I can't wait for people to find this out. Cause that seems like it's the real, the real reason to get this thing, but it, it has dual native ISO, meaning if you look at like the GH5, it's native ISO is 200. Although when you shoot in vlog, it's native ISO is 400, which means at 400, you're going to get like optimal noise and dynamic range. The GH5S is optimal at 400 and also at 2500. I don't understand exactly the science, but it's like they make two circuits or something. Uh, that's a, that's well, all that's I, I was going to say, because when we turn up the ISO in general, it's like turning up, a, I think of it like audio where you're turning up the gain, you know, exactly. You're turning which up is gain. going to increase the volume, but it's going to take noise up along with it. Whereas right. if it has dual native ISO, maybe it's some dedicated circuitry it switches between that has, isn't just cranking the gain, but it's just a whole circuit dedicated to running a higher, which is very interesting. I really wonder how they pulled that off. Yeah, that's exactly right. It, it eliminates the gains. You're starting at like a zero gain with each of those ISOs, which means that effectively when you shoot 12,800 ISO on the new camera, you're effectively getting the same noise performance as 1600 on the gh5 and how many times brighter is that how much more light let's see 1600 to 3200 to 6400 to so it's eight times brighter wow it's three stops that's massive yeah well and i would never imagine doing 12800 on the on the gh5 usually 1600 is about where i stop and i yeah. can go up to 32 or 64 if i really need to but usually I know those are going to be But you're making noisy. a sacrifice at that point. Yeah, yeah. And so I don't even know, I don't know if you'd ever want to use the extended ISO all the way up to the top, but it sounds like the new range, it runs all the way up to 204,000 ISO. Jeez. What is that, like <laughs> candlelight level I guess filming? <laughs> I wonder if this will be interesting for like astrophotographers and stuff. Because now we get to the point where people are saying it has better low light than like the A7S and, and the Sony cameras. Yeah, so like Engadget put out a review and they said, quote, even at 12,800 ISO, the image held saturation and contrast in a way that handily bested Sony's low light champ, the A7S II. Wow. I think it was That's clear kind of that exciting. this is what Panasonic was trying to do when they came out with a super low light camera. I think they were definitely going after Sony. Bum, bum, bum. I've still never <laughs> shot with a Sony camera. I would really like to. I was about to say that I would like to as well, but maybe I maybe I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I have such a good relationship with Panasonic. <laughs> then they'll, they're going to kick you out of the family. <laughs> uh, we got another tweet from Helder Mira. Did you shoot the behind the scenes with the GH5S? Wondering your thoughts on the camera. And uh, Helder also says great piece, by the way. So nice work oh, thank on Thank you. Uh, no, I didn't shoot with the GH5S. It, it was kind of like last year when the GH5 came out. I remember they gave me two bodies to shoot with, but there weren't a lot of bodies to go around. Like Luke Newman got a couple. I got a couple. That was about it for a while. Uh, and the same with GH5S. There weren't many models to go around. So I actually shot the behind the scenes on my GH5. But so one of the differences between our projects, if you watch my behind the scenes films there's three of them they're all shot in 4k i use 60 frames per second so i have some slow-mo and um and but it's, it's all produced in 30p but the ones shot on the gh5s they took advantage of the extra dynamic range and they actually mastered them in hdr hmm. so if you have an hdr tv or monitor they are on youtube in hdr so my behind the scenes is not it's SDR standard dynamic range, but uh, the finished films that these filmmakers made uh, are all in HDR, which looks pretty incredible. So I have a 4K HDR TV. I wonder if I use the built-in YouTube app if I can get full HDR off of YouTube. I would think I could. Yeah, you would expect so, unless the app. Wanted to give the, that a whirl. Yeah. We also got a tweet from Francisco Gonzalez wondering how this might compare to Panasonic's pro camera, their cinema camera, the EVA-1. And the price tag is very different. 
we haven't even talked about the price on the GH5S. It's twenty four ninety nine. So GH5S is five hundred dollars more than G GH5. GH5. But the EVA one is like seven thousand something. Seven thousand two hundred forty five on B and H right now. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it's a completely different. I mean, it's a cinema camera. It has XLR inputs. It has ND filters built in. Um, it's a super thirty five size sensor. It uses an EF mount, so it's Canon glass on the camera. It's a different camera, but people were excited about the EVA one has dual native ISO. Its native ISOs happen to be oh, so is this a brand new camera too? Did it just come out or has yeah, it, been it came out, out in the last year. Okay, yeah. Uh, so I think people are comparing the GH5S to it because of the dual native ISO, but still they're very different cameras. I mean, similar feature set, but different market, really. Yep. Speaking of HDR, um, we should answer this question real quick. This was a YouTube comment we got from Marcel Patillo, who shoots on the GH5, and he's curious about that feature that's on the GH5, hybrid log gamma, HLG, mm -hmm. which actually I can't even remember if it was on the camera originally, if it was only on it in version... 2.0 firmware but he's wondering if to future proof projects he should go ahead and be shooting everything in hlg right now now do you have to be shooting in vlog to get hybrid log gamma i guess i don't even know so it's good that you mentioned vlog because they are two different picture profiles on the camera you can do hlg or you can do vlog and my understanding of hlg is that it actually doesn't shoot as much dynamic range as V-Log. It's actually a little bit more crushed. But the idea of HLG is that you're capturing high dynamic range in the camera and it's putting in the metadata and everything in the file. And this is a file that will be ready to play on your HDR TV. So your raw footage could be ready to go for an mm -hmm. HDR TV. But if you're going to do color correction and and actually edit the piece and master it for HDR, if you have all that the, that whole skill set, it would make sense to actually shoot it in V-Log instead. Okay. So I don't think this HLG is kind would be the best more, way to future-proof. It's proof. almost like easy mode for HDR. Exactly, um, yeah. And I, I think Hybrid Log Gamma is a format where the SDR and HDR signal are kind of in the same file, right? So it'll play fine on a standard so. Def TV and an HDR TV. Right. Do I have that right? I'm, I'm not saying that as a fact. I'm, I guess I'm... No, I, th I'm I think you are think right. So. Yeah. Okay. So I think Good. Vlog I like would be right. the best way to future-proof your stuff. You know, if that's what your raw footage should be in. Um, but if your goal is just to, like, get it really quickly onto your HDR TV and, and enjoy the experience right away without any editing, HLG would be a better way to shoot. What else does this GH5S have? All right, so... I already talked about the last thing, which is uh, price. So really, there's only three things left that are different. Um, this camera, the GH5S, includes V-Log, which oh, it's a, was not it's included. Oh, it's an extra add-on on the on the GH5, right? Right. What is it? It's like a $99 or something? Oh, uh, $100 okay. upgrade, yeah. So when you're looking at the price tag, this camera is $500 more. I suppose that includes a $100 uh, V-Log upgrade. Nice. Uh, and you don't have to install it. It's it's on the camera when you get it. They also added a feature that I have no use for, but <laughs> there are many people. In fact, some of the filmmakers I talked to were excited about this. Uh, it has a time code. They've they've turned the flash port into a time code port for like syncing time code between cameras. Yeah, that's probably really nice for people who have a lot of different cameras and recording devices. They need to sync up easily. Yeah. So apparently it's like it's still the same physical flash port. They've just changed the hardware inside the camera and they are giving you a adapter cable that turns it from that flash port into a BNC adapter. So you can plug it in. And there's one feature you haven't said yet that I am most excited about. <laughs> You're excited about the cosmetic red detailing? That's it, baby. <laughs> Tell me about it. Well, this was, I mean, it was fun to shoot behind the scenes because it, I was happy to see that there were three cosmetic differences on the camera. I mean, the camera, the body is exactly the same between the GH5S and the GH5, except for the, the new sensor, really. But 
they made the record button red. Whew. The video record button on top. They added a red ring around the drive mode dial. Slow down, baby. And the logo. They've added a little red S under the GH5. It's extremely exciting. It was funny because I, I didn't include these in the behind the scenes videos, but I asked everyone that I, I interviewed who was using the GH5S, I think I asked them, like, so how excited are you about that red record button? <laughs> <laughs> so it's not just me. You were excited too. Yeah. Well, and I also asked everyone, another thing I didn't include in the pieces uh, was I asked everyone if they knew why it was called the GH5S. Like what the S, S is means. for speed. Yeah, that's that's actually a pretty good guess. I S I think is it's for actually, I think it's actually sensitivity. Sensitivity. Like low light sensitivity. That's it's what a I was going to say next. Camera. I just thought like <laughs> Apple does that, you know, you got like the the iPhone 6S and S just means like better. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, I think when I was interviewing Luke, I think he said like super <laughs> <laughs> which is that could be true too who knows well did i i think we answered all the gh5s questions we got this week did i answer all of your gh5s questions no. so do you have one right now <laughs> i don't no wow I you know what's funny you though there. i guess not they should when, send me one and then you won't have one and i will and that'd be awesome that, w- that would be awesome <laughs> you know it's what's funny happen. Speaking of the of the red detailing, I loved watching the rumor sites in the weeks before Panasonic announced it because you know who was spotted with one of these? I don't. Popular YouTuber Casey Neistat. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And people could he, tell because of the, the different styling on the camera. Yeah, it was funny. I loved it that they could tell because like I think he was like in a helicopter or something and he had posted like a selfie of himself hanging out the helicopter but if you like zoom in you could see that like hanging around his neck is this camera that looks just like a gh5 but happens to have a red ring around around the drive mode dial people are impressive so they didn't even see the gh5 they didn't see the s they just saw the red ring yeah i think the s was obscured i'm not even sure how people maybe that was leaked early on what this camera was going to look like and people just knew what they were looking for Well, I guess we should get to some questions in just a moment. We're going to be answering your questions about daylight balanced bulbs, how to transfer large video files online, and whether you should give your client the raw footage. Handy Filmmakers is brought to you by Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, website, or online store, make it with Squarespace. You know, a lot of people ask me about what platform to use for for podcasting. And when we started this show, I was looking around at the pricing for everything. I mean, there's plenty of services that are just podcasting, but I actually needed a website as well. So in the end, Squarespace turned out to be the smartest way for me to have a website for myself, griffinhammond.com, and also use it as a place to, I'm essentially just using the blogging platform that's built in as a way to publish RSS and the podcast. So yeah. like, like always, you should go to hey.film to read our show notes for this week. This week, you'll find the three videos that I've been talking about that I shot for Panasonic. Um, Also that top, not even top 10 list, just the 10 things that are different about the GH5S. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash griffin to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you, Squarespace. Nick, I really love this first question that we have today i think you're gonna like it a lot (laughs) i just glanced at it now i'm excited (laughs) i think this is maybe the best question we've ever gotten on the show Uh, this is a tweet from mark vaughn who i think we've actually played a video from him before he's a he's a doctor um he did a a vocal we had a vocal question that he helped with right yeah yeah i remember that so Mark Vaughn, MD, is planning an original web series which takes place in a doctor's office. Good use of resources you have. And he would like to integrate West Wing-like walks through the halls and rooms. Would you recommend switching out my entire office to daylight-balanced bulbs? 
All right, so first thing we gotta get to. The term for this is a walk and talk. Walk and talk, yes. Yes, and uh, I think, you know, so Aaron Sorkin is known as the, you know, the West Wing guy, he's the original creator, but I think the walk and talk really comes from Tommy Schlamme, who is executive producer and one of the directors of, um, I think he directed the the pilot and a lot of the kind of the key episodes, and I think it's kind huh. of a Tommy Schlamme creation, that walk and talk. Um, yeah. And some of those walk and talks got extremely uh, long and uh, complicated. So it's, it's I, I love the West Wing Weekly podcast, and they talk about those quite a bit. So. For a walk and talk, I imagine you would not need in body image stabilization because you're using a steady cam. That's right. And this question is great because we are both big fans of West Wing and Aaron Sorkin. God, I love that show. <sighs> I do love that show. But and also, daylight bulbs. What do you think? I oh, kind of did this in my office uh, when I lived in Bloomington, Illinois. I was shooting so many indie mogul videos in my office that I just went ahead and changed all the bulbs in that room to daylight bulbs, like Mark was talking about. They were all CFLs. I think they were fifty five hundred Kelvin, which I felt like was a pretty nice kind of close to to, to most sunlight. Um, color temperatures that were coming through my windows i loved it but i'll tell you what my my wife amy hated it (laughs) it was something she always hated about my office because you can imagine all the bulbs in the in our home are like 3200 kelvin and only in this room are these like really blue white lights and they were pretty bright too so, so you walk into your room and it felt like like a sterile laboratory or something. Yeah. Um, I imagine if, like you said, Mark, if you do it to your entire office, maybe it won't be too big of a deal. I also just know that the bulbs I chose were also brighter. So I don't know. I guess you want to find something that all that lets you continue to do your work comfortably. But, but the problem we're trying to solve here is if you're shooting during the day and you have a lot of sunlight streaming in then your bulbs are a little yellow you're going to have kind of this off color temperature is that kind of yeah. the, the, the issue yeah and in fact uh there's a, a story similar to this um alex buono who shoots a lot of the pieces for saturday night live when he shot the office hobbit mashup do you remember this vaguely they, yeah they did like a lord of the rings thing in in like the NBC show, the office kind of thing. And so they shot it in an office and I think they encountered the problem where every, every fluorescent bulb they had was like a different color. Like some of them were like green and you know, you can imagine like a real <laughs> office. So I think they just came in and rather than like they were shooting everywhere. So they couldn't even just bring in lights. I think they just replaced every one of the bulbs in the, in the office to make them all match. So, so yeah, there's one a good, way to go. Yeah, it's a good argument for doing it. You may just be asked by everyone who you work with to change them back. (laughs) Here's an email that we got from Catherine who says that she's been editing on a 27-inch iMac for a while, and sadly the display panel died. So I guess it's still a working computer, but she can't see it. Uh, So she's wondering about external monitors, uh, what she should look for, what to avoid. She knows that you briefly mentioned how gaming monitors aren't necessarily great editing monitors so what advice do you have for her yeah so there's a there's a bunch of different display technologies uh out there um uh you'll hear ips uh when i don't remember what it stands for but that's that's an lcd display technology that's very color accurate the displays in the imac are ips displays and they're really high quality um Gaming monitors uh, tend to be um, TN or VA, uh, just different technology. Less accurate colors, but faster refresh rate. So when you're doing gaming at 144 frames per second, you need something that can that can keep up. Um, you know, it's hard to beat the displays that come in the IMAX. Uh, Apple does not currently make any displays. Though I think uh, we'll be seeing a standalone 5K display from them in the next year or so as the uh, as the Mac Pro comes out. Yeah. Um, the 27 iMac, if it's a relatively recent one in the last three or four years, 
was a 5K display, and there's really no way to get a 27-inch 5K display externally yet. Um, there's just not, the, the the connectivity like no one. technology is not there yet. Hmm. Um, so I I mean I would probably I'm sure it's expensive if it's out of warranty, but I would probably look to getting the iMac display fixed. Otherwise, Apple is pushing. I forget what brand Apple is pushing, but they've got one on their website. That's a 4K display that they kind of recommend right now. Let me see if I can find it real quick. So you're saying like the display on a new iMac is like plugged right into the motherboard or something. Like it has a faster connection. And you just can't replicate that through. You can't replicate that ports. with an external display. You'd have to go down to 4K. Um, yeah. That might be changing here as some new display technologies come out. But like I think Thunderbolt 2 and USB 3 are not fast enough to push a 5K mm. display. Yeah, um, it's something like that. So yeah, um, I can't accessories here. It is let's see. Yeah, LG Ultra Fine. Oh, it is a 5K display. So maybe I'm full of, full of crap. They do push an <laughs> uh, LG Ultra Fine 5K display, which is a 27 inch IPS P3 wide color gamut. That's um, you know the the color profile. Is that what it's called, Griffin? It's We've called the color gamut. A little bit. Yeah, color gamut. And it connects over Thunderbolt 3. So you would need uh, Thunderbolt 3. Maybe Thunderbolt 2 is what I was thinking of that couldn't do uh, 5K. Right. So if you've got Although Thunderbolt for, 3 on iMac, iMac is old enough, it may only have Thunderbolt 2. And this display is also $1,300. So right. it might make more sense to get that bad boy repaired. Or pick up the brand new iMac Pro, which looks amazing. <laughs> I think you should get an iMac Pro, Griffin. No, we've talked about it. it's too expensive for me. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> I'll chip in. No, oh, cool. A very small amount. <laughs> Here's an and email. And now we've lost our show notes. Yeah, good. I'm glad you're on it because I don't know yeah. where we are anymore. <laughs> we got an email from Joshua who is near the end of editing a short film, but he shot the thing in anamorphic, and he's still trying to figure out exactly how to get that perfect 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio instead of, or I guess he did shoot it in 16 by 9, but he wants to he wants to crop it. So he's seen people add a PNG, just add black bars, a PNG image file, uh, to get that crop. And he's wondering if that's the best way to go or if he should change his sequence settings. What would you guess you should do. I, would, I mean, it's. I'm not quite sure how you do it outside of Final Cut, but I would be creating a project or a sequence with the exact um, dimensions that I want my final project to be, and that's going to make it really easy to um, crop or move the frame around uh, for the exact framing I want. Wouldn't you think yeah. so? Yeah, I think that makes the most sense because all these platforms now, I think even YouTube and definitely Vimeo, they can support some of these weirder or widescreen frame. Um, resolutions so there's no need to add the black bars when you could just upload a native widescreen video and it'll be respected so yeah i would get your sequence settings right and i i was looking because i actually don't know exactly what resolution you would want and it kind of depends on how you shot it uh one resolution that i came upon that that seems like a good fit is if you shot in 4k let's say you shot in 16 by 9 4k then you're your image size might be 3840 by 2160. And yep. I've seen a lot of people using the resolution of 5120 by 2160. So it's the same vertical resolution as 4K. And then it's just wide enough to be, I think it actually is exactly 2.37 to 1. And you see well, a lot of times, you see people talking about anamorphic widescreen. Yeah, like why isn't it 2.35, you mean? Well, go ahead. Keep talking while I g gather my thoughts. My brain is melting with this math. Well, you see a lot of people using in, for anamorphic either 2.35 to 1 or 2.39 to 1. And I've I've bet in the past that most people wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And I'm noticing a lot of the resolutions that are popular do seem to fall in the 2.37, like they're right in between. And I think it's because that number's kind of weird. I think the more another number that people use is instead of 16 by 9, this is 21 by 9. I think 21 divided by 9 is. Oh, wait. Maybe I have that number wrong. That's only 2.33. I don't know. 
It's close. What is what is the resolution of a standard sixteen by nine four K? Can you say that again? Thirty eight forty by twenty one sixty is is um, UHD ultra high def. So let me ask this: if you were <laughs> if you have sixteen by nine, so if you shot something in thirty eight forty by twenty one sixty, you would need to reduce the vertical resolution, not expand the horizontal, right? Right. So yeah, wouldn't so maybe you want to do thirty eight forty by something smaller? Yeah, that would be another way to go. Uh, the reason and I that throw way out you're this not way. blowing up pixels or something like that. Yeah, the the reason I threw out a larger, um, a, a larger one is I didn't know if he was definitely cropping sixteen by nine or if he had shot it in sixteen by nine but with an anamorphic lens. Oh, okay. So my feeling okay, is that so you if might you do have twenty one sixty, yeah, then you probably want to maintain those vertical pixels. But yeah, either, either option would be good. Okay. But if you if he was not shooting with anamorphic lenses and he doesn't have a squeeze, it probably makes more sense to crop in as opposed to blow out the the resolution, right? Right. Yeah. That's a technical term, blow out the resolution. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's with me on that, right? <laughs> but then like another weird way to go about this is you th- th- we're all this whole time we're talking about square pixels. Mm-hmm. You could also have anamorphic pixels. Your pixels could be instead of being perfectly one by one squares each pixel could actually be four by three so now if you take a 16 a by nine number of pixels but make them all four by three pixels then you'd get a, a resolution like the one i'm how do you address the pixel ratio it doesn't even make sense you can remember we used to do that with uh, standard definition video i don't remember that so standard definition was it was always 720 by 480 Mm-hmm. But it's funny whenever you see like a, a screen grab of standard definition video on the internet, a lot of times it's stretched wider than it should be because television pixels, like standard definition pixels on a TV are not square. They're 0.9 ratio. They're actually like a little bit taller than they are wide. I don't remember this at all. Wow. <laughs> so, so... Standard definition video was a 720 by 480 resolution, but it was effectively 640 by 480. So you'd almost, anytime you did like a screen grab from standard, you would have to like squeeze it in Photoshop before you put it on the internet. Otherwise it would look wrong. And actually, I still notice this today. A lot of times when I see people mixing standard definition video and HD video, the telltale sign is not only is the resolution pretty low but it's like wait this person looks fatter in that shot and they look normal in this shot <laughs> That's so yeah crazy. you can always you can always mess around with pixel shapes <laughs> and uh and i think you, you may be able to do that in, in premiere and in final cut is change you change to like anamorphic my pixels. mind <laughs> which kind of makes sense to think about it that way because you if you're shooting with an anamorphic lens you're squeezing things onto uh, a 16 by 9 frame or a 4 by 3 frame and it feels kind of weird to like make extra pixels so it kind of makes sense in a way to just like make take the pixels you already have and make them wider on but if you're playing at one to one there's you can't stretch a pixel on a monitor so now you can't yeah. get a perfect yeah, pixel perfect representation of your video i don't like it but you never could because you shot it weird you know you shot it with a anamorphic lens onto square that. pixels <laughs> Don't tell me that. <laughs> there's always going to be some weird de-squeezing and stretching and all that happening. So I guess there's a few different ways to do it. You've blown my mind too much. I'm moving on. We've got a YouTube comment from TJ Basinger. How do you and Nick transfer your videos for each podcast? I'm looking for the best way to transfer large video files remotely. He's tried wetransfer.com plus transfer.com and Google Drive, but wonders if we have any other suggestions. And Griffin, I how do we he, do it? He's put, like... He put two gigabytes next to we transfer, five gigabytes next to plus transfer. Are those the limits? That would be my guess. Is those are the free limits? Maybe you have to pay to yeah. to go beyond beyond those file sizes. Yeah, we we sling some large files back and forth, don't we? Yeah, I think sometimes you're sending me like eight gigs or something just for one episode, one podcast. Yeah, yeah. Um, the way we do it is through a piece of software called Resilio Sync. So we're not using mm-hmm. a cloud based service. Uh, this, these files are just coming straight from Nick's computer right to my computer through a 
through a torrent software. Yep. Resilio so Sync. That they have a free version uh, that doesn't have all the features, but for what we do, the free version is perfect, and you can transfer as much as you want. My computer has to be on while Griffin is downloading, and it's not like it's up in the cloud where he can download whenever he wants, but after we finish the podcast, I copy all the files to my computer, I create a Resilio Sync folder and send a little link to Griffin, and he clicks on it, and his Resilio Sync connects to my computer, and yeah. away it goes. Actually, it doesn't and go very sometimes- fast because your internet is slow, but... Right. Well, that's kind of the frustrating thing is it feels like it's going so slowly because we're the only two participants, I guess. But you figure we both save time. Well, you save time on your end because you don't actually have to upload it anywhere. It's right. just I'm immediately pulling it from you. Yeah. I mean, if um, you're going to are you going to have to edit this podcast tonight? You are, aren't you? So that would yeah, really normally we record this podcast for me like, to upload. <laughs> normally we record this like like maybe couple days be? early yeah like a day and a half before it publishes uh tonight we're doing it late so i'm actually going to have to edit it immediately <laughs> so that it's Sorry. available early in the morning <laughs> That's okay. i like to make your friend's life a little a little more difficult <laughs> so let's hope resilio sync moves quickly this evening <laughs> All right, we've got an email from Thomas. He says, like most freelancers, I get stuck on how much to charge for my work. I've started to learn how much I won't work for, which is helpful, but picking out an hourly rate is not easy. Should you somehow incorporate your equipment cost into your rate? Did you increase your rate when you upgraded to better equipment? So I've never thought about my equipment as part of my cost. I've never like made that calculation and said, well, I spent $2,000 on a camera, so I need to get some of that money back in my hourly rate you've never you've never thought about your equipment that way have you i mean no i always think of it as just an expense that i incur so i try and be smart about it and i don't think i've ever made a purchase and then immediately upgraded my rate but i think i'm i'm constantly trying to get equipment that keeps up with my abilities and i'm always trying to grow and get some new equipment to learn from so i think it's just been a natural progression that by the time I upgrade my rate from $100 an hour to 150 or from 150 to 200 it's a recognize recog- I'm recognizing that I am better but also yeah I guess I do have more stuff now that's kind of why my videos are better cuz I'm bringing better mics and lights and all that stuff in conclusion you can probably charge more than you think yeah <laughs> but I think having an hourly rate is just a good exercise and just kind of asking yourself what amount of money would it take to get you out the door and to start figuring out for bigger projects, you know, before you tell someone, well, this is a $20,000 project. You know, like hopefully you have some sense of how many hours it's actually going to take. And does it, does it make sense to charge that much? I've got a YouTube comment from, oh boy, that's another one that's going to mess me up. I guess it's Kisiel with a three instead of an E. I, I think I pronounced it as Kisi 3L last time. But. Kisi 3L. From Poland. From Poland. <laughs> hey, Griffin and Nick. Happy New Year. Still listening to the podcast while editing, which just blows my mind. But hey, I'm glad it's working for you. Do you ever give your raw footage to a client after finishing the final product, or is it always a no? I want to say it. It's always a no, but I know I've broken that rule. Like, that should be a rule, I think, is don't give clients raw footage. What do you think? So, yeah, I mean, I've run into this a few times with wedding videos. Um, In general, if I've already been paid and I've already completed my edit and they're happy with it and then they ask for raw footage, I will generally say yes. And usually they have a specific reason. Maybe uh, I've been asked because, you know, a family member has passed away and they just want to look through it all and see if they have any clips of that person or something. And I'm always going to say yes in that situation. I think it's dangerous to give a client the raw footage before the project is done, before they've signed off on the final edit, before you've been paid, because uh, then they can kind of really uh, try and wrestle creative control from you. So right. if there's a good reason and I've been paid and the project is done, in general, I will say, yes, you may have it. Um, I, I usually say you have to bring me a portable hard drive or a flash drive that's big enough. You know, I'm not going to um, burn it all to DVDs or do anything crazy like that. But I will give it up um, in the few times I've been asked as long as I've been paid is the oh, big yeah. one. 
Well, and one of my hesitations is, and I've, I've learned from this now, so now if someone asks me for raw footage, I recognize that there are going to be some expenses and some time cost. Like, I do need to find a hard drive. So usually, yeah, I have them buy a hard drive for me. Um, and Or maybe I'll mark up the price of a hard drive a little bit um, to kind of incorporate my time, and I'll go buy the hard drive to mail them. But I realize just to give someone my raw footage is going to require me some time of organizing the footage in a way that's going to make sense to them. Like, on, I mean, on my projects now, and especially a wedding can be kind of complicated. It's like, I'm going to have A cam and B cam and C cam, and there's audio that's maybe not even connected to the video. So how are you even going to watch the video without the audio? So maybe I need to actually like sync some audio and export it again, or I at least just need to put things in folders so you can manage all this stuff. They just get well, however I organize my raw footage is how they get it, <laughs> and yeah. they can deal with it. Yeah, mine usually come out pretty clean. I have separate folders for every SD card, and I have separate folders yeah. for every audio recorder. Just that's just the way I organize my footage. So, yeah. But one one problem I've had is I gave a wedding client raw footage because, like a lot of wedding clients, she thought she wanted it. Um, I think a lot of people think they want it, but. Right. When they watch your product, they probably realize, and then watch the raw footage, they probably realize, oh, he already did the job of culling this down and made it into something that's worth watching. But I realized with one client, I'm not even sure if I was watch shooting 4K yet. This was years ago. But still, the 1080 files, I think they were 60 frames per second in H.264, they were too processor intensive for her computer to play back. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that can be a problem. So it's kind of like, what what good is it to have all this footage when you can't watch it? <laughs> get a new computer. Your May I recommend the iMac Pro, Mr. Hammond? <laughs> I think you'll really get some good value out of that. Yeah. Your render times could be cut in half, if not faster. <laughs> How does that make you feel? Well, maybe I should do it. <laughs> You're a cheapskate. <laughs> We've got an email from Reed, who says he's listened to a couple dozen episodes over the holidays. That sounds like too many episodes to listen to. I think he, no I think he recently discovered us, so then he just, he just binge just plowed listened. through them. Yeah, I mean, aren't we pretty boring? I just can't imagine that. Thank you. A couple you all for dozen. Listening. That's like I don't that's like half don't our understand. episodes. <laughs> Griffin, what's his question? The question from Reed is: He's hoping we can clarify why everyone is so enamored with 60 frames per second. Do people shoot 60 for slow-mo and then put it on 24 or 30p timeline? And then do you use the same 60p frame rate for interviews? So what do you think? Yeah, I think that's it's it's slow-mo, right? Yeah, that's the that's, main reason. I think why 80% of the people shoot 60 frames per second. Oh, and you know what? I feel like I missed... <laughs> Going back to the beginning of our episode, I feel like I missed one of the features of the GH5S. It wasn't Is on your that, list? No, it was, but somehow I didn't read it. <laughs> Is that they added... Great podcast, right, guys? <laughs> they added 60 frames per second recording in C4K. The GH5 can do C4. 60 frames per second, but only in UHD, in that 3840 resolution. But... Uh, on the GH5S, they've added in the slightly wider screen Cinema 4K, it can also do 30 frames and 60 frames. And I imagine for slow motion. Yep. Um, so on my projects recently that I was shooting for Panasonic, I shot everything in 60, not because I wanted to deliver in 60, but because I wanted to deliver in 30, and I thought... You know, I don't want to rely on slow motion as a as a crutch, but this was a project in particular where I didn't know if I was going to be spending a lot of time with each subject. I was worried that I might get there and not have a lot to shoot. So I thought I should at least be shooting everything in 60 so that if I'm in a bind, I have double the footage that I think that I do. Everything could be slow motion and it could take up some more time on the timeline. Um, luckily, I don't even think I relied on it too much, but it's kind of fun to, to have that ability. So you shoot um, everything at one one hundred twentieth uh, shutter speed, then? Yeah, because I'm just I'm, I have it set to one hundred and eighty um, degrees of shutter. Right. So when I'm in sixty, yeah, it's choosing a one 
one twentieth of a second. Let me ask a dumb question. So say you're shooting everything in 60p because you might want some slow motion, but then you go to an interview shot and you know this is not going to be slow motion because it's just an interview shot. Would it ever make sense just to adjust the shutter speed at that point since you know you're going to drop frames to um, 1 over 60 as opposed to 1 over 120? Yeah, that would actually make a lot of sense. Although I go ahead and I just switch it into 30 when I'm in an interview. Okay, so you do jump back and forth. As yeah, you because I think um, at least in the modes that I'm shooting in, it's a different bit rate. So I am taking up more space on the cards when I'm shooting uh, 60p. Got it. I think. Yeah, I'm pretty sure because I, I I'm I'm pretty sure that I get more time, and that that's mainly my my main concern when I'm doing documentary stuff is if I'm about to shoot a 20 minute interview, I might as well not have it take a take up as much space on the cards and who needs to edit through you know it's just more data for the computer to deal with yep but i occasionally forget to do that and then i just end up with an interview in 60 and that's not a big deal i mean it, interview subjects don't move around that much so i don't even know if you most people would notice i bought a new toy what did you buy i bought the elgato hd 60 s I don't know what that is. This is an HDMI capture box for oh. capturing HDMI footage right into a computer. So now, if I want to start streaming some video games, I can stream with my good camera hooked up. What do you think of that? Oh, so wait. I assumed you only wanted it to stream the game from the gaming system, but you actually want to plug a camera into it as well? Well, yeah, you couldn't do either. So I'm a PC gamer, right? So I'm just going to capture the oh. video straight from my PC, and then I'm going to use this to bring in high-quality camera video. Yeah, when but you told me you were getting I also, this, I assumed you, it was for, like, putting your PS4 into your computer. Which is an no. option as well. Yeah. Uh, my kids want to make Minecraft videos, so we're oh. going to be able to do that with this as well. It's kind of exciting. They do that on the PS4 or on the computer? They do, they do that on the PS4. Yeah. Cool. Um, but fun fact, the G85 does not have a full-sized HDMI output. Did you know this? Well, I figured, yeah, I probably didn't, because I think the GH5 has it, a full-size HDMI, and that was new for that model. So, yeah, I got this, and I went to go use it, and I was like, oh, it's it's got that um, mini HDMI. It's like, that's okay. I have one of those cables. I have a mini HDMI and HDMI cable. And I get that out, and the mini HDMI cable is too big to fit in the thing. I guess it's like a micro HDMI. Oh, yeah. Which I didn't even know existed. Yep, there's two different kinds. So, you know, actually, this just came today. Oh. High-speed micro HDMI to HDMI cable. Ready I was to about to say, like, I have a bunch of those sitting around that I don't need anymore because now I have a camera with full-size HDMI, but... Amazon can always send you stuff faster than I could. <laughs> yeah, and for cheaper, probably. I think it was like $6 <laughs> shipped. So uh, I'll be playing with that. It's going to be exciting. Yeah. When can we expect our your first video gaming video? TBD. <laughs> well, you Not know what? I will, I will share with people next week. Uh, I promised it this week. I told people last on our last episode that we would be talking about underwater stuff this time. You lied. But then the GH5S came out. We had to talk about that. Mm -hmm. So uh, next week, we'll talk about underwater photography and video. And Nick and I shot some stuff together. I remember. <laughs> also, I should mention that uh, about a week from today, if, uh, I guess next week, I'm leaving for Dubai. And I'll also be in Abu Dhabi. This is a State Department trip I'm going on. Mm -hmm. So I don't know my full itinerary yet, but my understanding is I'll be speaking at some universities and high schools, and I'm not sure yet if any of these will be public events, but if you are in the UAE, if you're in the United Arab Emirates, salam, and uh, drop me an email at griffin at hey.film and let me know if you want to meet up or if you want to come to an event, and I'll, I'll see, I'll keep you in the loop. Sounds awesome. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll talk to yeah. you later. Bye. Hope you don't mind I dropped in that little micro HDMI tidbit.
Nice job. It's really tiny. It almost looks like a micro USB.